Have you ever been in a vehicle driving and you felt a little sleepy? Maybe you've caught yourself drifting just a little. Maybe there's been a time where you can't remember driving the last few miles. You were so tired and you just kind of put yourself on autopilot. I remember one time I, two of my uh, brothers were, were together and my oldest brother Wayne was riding with my other brother Ken. They'd been out, I don't know, hiking, and they were on their way home. And Wayne, sitting in the passenger seat, drifted to sleep. But he was startled awake to see trees going by him at a very close proximity. You see, Ken, who had been driving, fell asleep also. And he just kind of drifted off the road. And um, they were very fortunate they didn't have any damage. But another time, a few years later, my father was driving his pickup from Texas to Oregon. He, he left in the evening after helping load the moving truck. And periodically through the night, he was, when he was tired, he would pull into a rest area and sleep for an hour or two, and then he would head on down the road. Um, at the time, I was living in Denver, Colorado, and he um, was going to spend Sabbath with me. And so Friday, it was about noon, and the sun was nice and warm, and the monotony of the road and the hum of the motor, he drifted to sleep. Dad said it was like awakening to a nightmare as he drove off a 15-foot embankment on the interstate in southern Colorado. It was a nightmare. The pickup was to totaled, and, but fortunately for him, he was not seriously injured, although he had glass in his shoes and the back rim of his cowboy hat was sheared off. Today, we are going to talk about the final days, D-A-Z-E. I believe that many in this world are in the final days, D-A-Z-E. We're not only in the final days, D-A-Y-S, but we are in a daze. We are, we are drifting along. The world is drifting along, half awake, half asleep. And we too in the church are possibly in a daze. This Sabbath is communion here, but in many places around the world, last Sabbath, they celebrated communion on September 27. Imagine for a minute that you are worshiping in the little Adventist church in Horlivka, Ukraine, last Sabbath. You are sitting in church listening to the sermon before celebrating the Lord's Supper when suddenly unidentified men carrying machine guns and wearing camouflage burst into church. It happened. They interrupted the service. They pointed their machine guns at you and ordered you to leave. Would you be wide awake? Would your heart be pumping? Would you be scared? That's what happened last Sabbath in Horlivka. They ordered the pastor to close the church. They forced him in a car, and they drove him away. And he's still missing. Have you listened to the news? ISIS beheadings. Ebola plague, with people becoming infected every day. They say over 3,300 have died already. 
shootings, volcanic eruptions, wars, rumors of wars, men, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, violence. Jesus told a parable. We find it in Matthew 25. He told a parable about the wise and foolish virgins. I'd like you to follow along in your Bibles. Matthew 25. We're going to begin with verses 1 to 5. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise. And five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all what? They all slumbered and slept. All of them. They were all in a date. D-A-Z-E. They all dozed. They all had lamps. That is, they all had the word of God. Remember, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. They all had the Bible. They were all virgins. They were all dressed in white, having knowledge of truth. They all had some oil. But there was a difference. Five had extra oil. Five did not. Their lamps were going out. The question then remains for us is how can we prepare for the end time crises? I'd like to propose three things that we can do. One is stay connected to Jesus. Staying connected to Jesus is absolutely essential. We will dry up and decay if we are not attached with a living connection to Jesus. The drought this summer is a perfect example where there's not enough water to nourish the trees or plants. The limbs and leaves wither. And when the strong winds blow, the results are seen. Trees blown over. Branches snapped off. So in our own lives, we need the life-giving water of time in the Word of God. We need the life-giving respiration of prayer in our daily communing with the life-giver. Number two, we need to grow in faith. We are each given a measure of faith. For some, it's only an itsy, bitsy, teensy, tiny seed. But Faith grows as it's exercised. Do you have faith in God's promises? That they are true and faithful? Do you believe it when he says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse? And, and I will open for you the windows of heaven and pour out such a blessing that there will be, not be room enough to receive it. Do you have faith? when a little trial or testing comes, that God is faithful and has a way through the trial, and he has not abandoned you? Do you have faith that God has work for you, whether you're a little child or an old person? Do you still have purpose in life? Faith, it will grow as you exercise it. And then the third item in preparing for the final crises is to be great in works and grow in works. We're not saved by works. However, when Jesus is Lord of our lives, he calls us beyond complacency. He calls us to be active in relieving the suffering of those around us. He calls us to take action in ministering to the needs of those less fortunate than we are. In the latter part of Matthew 25, the king says to those on his left, he says, Depart from me, you cursed, for I was hungry, 
and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. God's given each of us talents, abilities. We may not all be gifted the same way or able to minister in the same way, but God gives us opportunities to help the marginalized. He gives us opportunities to reach out to our neighbors, our friends, our acquaintances, and to the stranger. And when we do, we do it to Christ. In review, we need to stay connected to Jesus. We need to grow in faith and grow in works. God wants to transform our lethargy and indifference into spirit-filled commitment. You may be asking, so how does this connect with communion? Good question. As we sense God's high calling in our lives, as we sense our need for more of God's spirit in our lives, we realize that we've become lethargic and indifferent. We realize that we have become soiled and in need of cleansing. We also realize that all of our righteousness is as filthy rags. And that Jesus needs to give us hearts like his. Eyes to see the needs of those around us and ears to hear the cries for help that may be whispered by desperate and lonely people. We need revitalization and the filling of the Holy Spirit. We need the washing and cleansing from sin symbolized by the mini baptism we need the blood of Jesus to cover our lives. His shed blood spilled out for our sins. We need the bread of his pure and holy life to permeate every cell of our be being. In Christ's object lessons, there's this inspirational message. It's the privilege of every soul to be a living channel through which God can communicate to the world the treasures of his grace and the unsearchable riches of Christ. There is nothing that Christ desires so much as agents who will represent to the world his spirit and character. There is nothing that the world needs so much as a manifestation through humanity of the Savior's love. All heaven, did you hear that? All heaven is waiting for channels through which can be poured the holy oil to be a joy and blessing to human hearts. Christ has made every provision that his church should be a transformed body, illumined with the light of the world, possessing the glory of Emmanuel. It is his purpose that every Christian should be surrounded with a spiritual atmosphere of light and peace. He desires that we should reveal his own joy in our lives. So today, let's not wait for a crisis like the church in Ukraine had last week, but to awaken us out of our days. But let's allow God's word penetrate deep into our lives. Let's let God transform our lethargy and indifference into spirit-filled commitment.